my name is Rasmus. I'm just going to have the first spend the first minute or two um, speaking with you about uh, CBN and CBA and whatever all kind of abbreviations, it's just to make sure that we get everyone in. Um, uh, uh, we're getting the there, yes. Uh, the reason why we're doing this in the first place is that here at Creative Business Network, we like to support the startups, the entrepreneurs in the creative industries, and we do that not because we need more shoes or hats or gloves, uh, but because the creative industries can come up with some great solutions to many of the challenges that the world is facing, including, of course, also job growth and exports and, uh, and innovation. But uh, just as importantly, it's how the creatives can contribute to the SDGs, to uh, public health, to all kinds of, of different issues. Um, and uh, we have discovered that uh, startups in the, in the culture and creative industries usually have some different challenges. We also have some other opportunities, such as being extremely powerful sometimes. You know, we can start a revolution with, uh, with uh, some of the creative products or services. Or uh, in Denmark, we had a crisis when someone made a, a cartoon of uh, a profit. Uh, that uh, is just, you could say, for some, a cartoon, but for others, really infused with a lot of symbolic value. And that makes it, uh, that makes it uh, really a powerful um, statement. So uh, my point is here that we are dealing with some industries that are, are really good to, to deal with when it comes to change and innovation. But on the other hand, they also need some, some help sometimes. And one of the areas where they are usually born is they're born global. They usually uh, have um, a market reach that's global. And uh, you would think that in a, such an obscure language like Danish with 28 vowel sounds, uh, the, our TV series wouldn't be very successful. Uh, but they have actually been traveling the world with organ and the bridge and the, and the killing, uh, even in the original language, which is quite amazing. <laughs> Maybe one day Denmark would be the language on love and not French or Italian or whatever they're saying. It's Dutch, isn't it, Rianne? Um, so, uh, Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so uh, now I've been ad-libbing a bit. Um, we're doing this uh, internationalization webinar only last uh, about an hour um, because we would like to make you guys aware that we are running in June uh, a whole academy, uh, not only for the startups that are the finalists this year. So we have this competition going on, the Creative Business Cup. Here are all the finalists from last year and this year will participate and there will be lots of great uh, classes, lectures. But we're also doing one for those of you who work with policy, who work with how to implement stuff that will make it good for the creatives to grow and to innovate. And in, in, in one of these areas, besides access to finance and IPR, is internationalization and market access, because you are usually born uh, international. Um, and for that, we have a really uh, great uh, panel that uh, will be introduced in a little while by my great co-host, uh, Daniela Molina from Guatemala. And uh, I will now give the word to Daniela. Thank you so much, Rasmus. Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, yes, we have an excellent panel today. We have uh, four uh, amazing persons. Uh, we have Rian, uh, we have Liva, and we have Maria, and of course, we have Mark. Uh, Rian is the Director of Creative Industries in a bunch of uh, Austria. Sorry, uh, Liva is Project Manager at the Red Jacket. Maria Basora is the Market and Development Director in the Institute of uh, Cultural Enterprise. And Mark is the co-founder of Pocket Sky. He's going to talk about uh, his experience like going abroad. And um, I just want to start with a quick um, Mentimeter question. So we're doing a small survey, survey with you guys where we will ask you to go to menti.com, M-E-N-T-I.com. So grab your uh, mobile phone or your um, or open another window in your browser, and then the code is? 4262-1983. I'm going to chat also in the, I'm going to write it also in the chat. So go to menti, M-E-N-T-I.com, 4262-1983. I 
can see people joining in there. But yes, please go uh, grab your smartphone or your computer and enter the code. Yes, I can see. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, the first question is, uh, where are you coming from? So where are you right now? That's what we would like to know. We have Denmark, we have Latvia, we have Italy, Tunisia. Austria. So we have a pretty nice audience today. Vienna, calling Denmark, Tunisia, Latvia, etc. So please go, because there will be some other questions that the speakers will need as hints. So please go in there and... Um, yeah. The second question is why internationalization is important. Give me a short answer, don't worry. Three words. For global growth. Growth. The local market, yes. Opportunity. The world, your feet, I love it. Knowledge, market, talent, networking, collaboration, inspiration. All good answers. So a lot about getting more revenue. We got a bigger market. Yep. Yeah. And why internationalization is difficult, and what can we do about it? Why do you think it's so difficult? So we are giving both the problem and the answer in one, I guess, here. Um, Cultural barrier, political barrier, COVID. Listening the open-minded. Empathy. So here we see some of the barriers. There are language, political, uh, cultural, uh, regulation, customs, etc. Okay, and the last question. Is your country development uh, in innovative approach to help the creative industry? So where you come from? Okay, uh, yeah, we have the, the majority is yes. That's good. It's good that most countries now have realized that the creative industries are a, a factor for many uh, market um, benefits, growth, jobs, exports, but also lots of non-market benefits. Great. Thank you so much. Um, this was the answer and it's going to help uh, the, the audience and of course the speakers to, to direct the, the speakers. So now I think we should ask Rian to um, uh, unmute and uh, you can maybe elaborate a bit. I, you have internationalized yourself already by going from uh, the Netherlands to Austria. That's right. And that was the being first an undercover step. agent for the for the <laughs> for the Dutch foreign service. And uh, so, if you uh, wouldn't mind, uh, you have a PowerPoint, I believe, that you need to share. But you maybe want to also just add a few words on how you ended up with Advantage Austria and what your role is. That's right. Do you see my presentation? Yeah, 
Okay, so a very warm welcome also from my side and thank you for having me here today. Uh, I am uh, based in Vienna, as Rasmus mentioned. I have been living here for the past 16 years, but I originally come from the Netherlands, as you also mentioned. And uh, originally when I came to Vienna, I only wanted to stay for one year, but as things happen, uh, I'm still here after 16 years and I still like it very much. And I am working for Advantage Austria, which is the Austrian foreign trade promotion organization. And uh, I have been working here for 12 years now. And I will show you my slides to give you a bit more background information. Let me see if I, yeah, this is better full screen. So um, Advantage Austria is uh, active in the fields of foreign trade as well as international trend scouting and knowledge transfer. And we also have a network of around uh, 100 offices in 70 countries, both inside and outside of Europe. Uh, I will show you our network here. So as you can see, we have an office in Copenhagen, but also in many other different capital cities in Europe, but also outside of Europe. And uh, together with our offices, we provide a broad range of intelligence and business development services for both Austrian companies and their international business partners. And we organize well, under normal circumstances, because the last year has been a bit challenging, as you all know, but usually we organize around 1,200 events every year to bring together Austrian and international partners. You were about and to leave for uh, South by Southwest, I believe, last year in March. That's right. That's how it all ended or started just uh, how you look at it. But that's right, we were planning to fly to South by Southwest with a very big delegation. And one day before we, we would have left, we would have entered the plane, the whole event was canceled. And at that time we still thought, why is this necessary? And we could have gone there, but then things have developed so quickly that of course by now it's more than and clear but at that time we were really shocked and uh, yeah and you were and you were ahead of that delegation right so you were the one that had organized it all with south by southwest for the uh, austrian startups going there to promote themselves that's right i even brought a slide about this <laughs> 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 i uh yeah we have been visiting south by southwest since 2014 um, and uh, so to present Austrian creative uh, products, services, offerings there. Um, as you might know, South by Southwest is a huge festival with uh, 400,000 visitors from all around the world that come to Austin, where it is taking place every year. And it used to start as a music festival in the 80s, but then it quickly developed and it added film to their portfolio. And by now it's one of the most important and central uh, innovation festivals. Uh, globally, but always on the crossroads with creative industries. And uh, it is a great place to go to, to uh, find inspiration and to meet other startups and other companies, institutions, not only from the creative industries, but from all different fields you can think of. So uh, they also have a big focus on political issues or on marketing and on uh, digital transformation and future trends. And um, since 2014, we have been organizing uh, Austrian events there. For example, one year we had a focus on creative tech, where we showcased uh, companies that work in, in the arts or music or film or on the crossroads with technology. And also we uh, had a focus on music tech for one year. And last year, we decided to change our approach and to bring companies that are not actually from the creative industries there to uh, make them aware how important creativity is to, uh, to develop your company further. 
uh, and we actually had compiled a com uh, delegation of almost 150 people from big Austrian companies and also from institutions. But yeah, as mentioned, unfortunately, it didn't take place in the end as uh, the, the virus oh, I, came I, in between. <laughs> I didn't want to take you out of your rhythm with my question about South by Southwest. I know you have some slides before this. So yeah, no, wanna, I wanted to so tell it you... anyway, so... Okay, that's just... good. <laughs> that's it doesn't good. matter, it's just that's the difference. <laughs> yeah, but because I also, why, why, you, why you scroll back, I, I could ask you, um, you know, um, Sweden is known for H&M and Spotify and uh, a lot of other creative products, PP Longstocking, uh, Denmark maybe for Hans Christian Andersen and uh, um, our architects, etc. Um, to be honest, Austria, isn't that Red Bull? And then uh, I, I know a lot of, a lot of movies uh, that James Bond, etc., are being filmed in Austria uh, because they have a fantastic, lo fantastic locations. Uh, and you're willing to close down the, the city metro system for, for James Bond. But, uh, but, but uh, it must, how are you branding yourself? Well, actually, um, Austria has a very long tradition when it comes to creativity. So if you look back in the history of Austria and specifically Vienna, uh, you have a very rich history of, uh, of course, classical music and design. We had the Wiener Werkstätte. Uh, the Vienna workshops, if you uh, translate it literally, which mm -hmm. was like a consortium of designers and architects uh, that uh, used to work together and do a lot of very, uh, very special projects around the turn of the century. So that was around 1900, 1905. And also in the field of the arts, uh, Wiener Moderne, so uh, Viennese modernism, uh, there was a lot going on about a century ago. And then there was a period that uh, many people left Austria and then um, there was a bit of a tough period. But uh, by now, I think Austria is doing really well also internationally with their uh, offerings from the creative industries as they have a lot of uh, very talented uh, designers, for example. We will see Mark later on and he will also share some of his uh, uh, views and work. And I think he is also one of uh, the highlights Austria has to offer. So I'm yeah. <laughs> really looking forward to his contribution as well. But also, as you mentioned, in the field of film, Austria is also very well positioned. Um, I think in the 90 year history of the Oscars, Austria has won the Oscar uh, 35 times. And they are also very well positioned at other festivals and at, uh, uh, yeah, they are all almost always winning prizes. And also actually the music industry is also uh, quite successful internationally uh, with their own niche, not uh, specifically in the classical music anymore. So that doesn't really have our focus anymore, but they do know how to find their niche and they have a, quite an own style. Mm -hmm. with which they are also successful internationally. Yeah, I can, I can say that we, we have been running the Creative Business Cup since 2012 and uh, Austria has usually been in the top five uh, most of the time, if not in 2015, where you actually won the Creative Business Cup with Blytab, an iPad for blind people. Uh, the year before in 14, we had Pocket Sky visiting us, uh, a fantastic, uh, a fantastic uh, product there. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, Go ahead, uh, Rianne, you have about uh, a minute or two left. Okay, well, uh, I will do it brief then. So uh, going back to Advantage Austria, we are uh, based in Vienna and we are organized uh, on the one hand side in regions and uh, on the other hand side in sectors. And within this structure, I am responsible for creative industries, which means that we support Austrian companies from the creative industries to internationalize. And we have started this program in 2005. So uh, Advantage Austria is also uh, actually celebrating its 70th birthday this year, but creative industries has a focus since 2005. So it's still quite new. 
but I think uh, we are very active. So we do a lot to support uh, creatives from all different fields, uh, from design, fashion, music, film, the arts, architecture, publishing and media, literature. And our main aims, you can see them here, is to encourage internationalization within the creative industries in Austria, but also to make strategic use of creativity as a success factor and a competitive uh, edge uh, factor within uh, the international skills, so to say. And we also, of course, want to help the creative industries, companies to sell their products and services abroad and to, to stress and highlight their skills and their uh, specialties. And also one other very important aspect is that we want to break down the barriers between traditional businesses, which means industry and uh, other sectors and the creative industries. And for that, we organize a lot of events around the world. Usually, uh, the past year has been, uh, we have been focusing on, on virtual, virtual events like workshops and webinars, seminars. But in the past, we mainly organized uh, events. And one of our flagship events was uh, the Austrian National Exhibition at Salone del Mobile, which is the, the main design and furniture fair, which takes place in Milan every year. And we have been organizing Austrian exhibitions there since 2010. This was the last one um, in the year 2019, where our aim was to, uh, to develop an Instagrammable setting. And as you can see, it worked out because- Yeah, it looks, uh, looks like a lot of fun. <laughs> it was, yeah. <laughs> okay. And yeah, I already mentioned South by Southwest and yeah, the virtual events and uh, yeah, another aspect is building communities to that support our Austrian creatives to build up their networks and to to uh, connect to potential clients mm -hmm. and and we also have a funding program where uh, creative companies can apply for funding. That was in a nutshell, yeah. what we're doing. Thank you, Rian. Thank you, Rian. And, and it, as it actually proves the point that we can't just do this in an hour. And if some of you would like, in June, we will have this um, uh, one month of courses all related to policies and the creative industries and internationalization will be one of the topics and Rian will be one of the trainers. And now <laughs> let's move to, thank you, Rian, and let's move to Latvia. Latvia, one of our Baltic neighbors up here, um, you have also been really successful uh, in uh, in uh, sending startups to uh, the global finals when it took place in uh, in physically here in Copenhagen, Digi Blocks in 2014. I remember we're in the top three. I believe they came second. Uh, we have Game Changer Audio that also did extremely well. Solfeggio, Vividly. Uh, there's a lot of, of, of great uh, Latvian startups out there. And you, uh, Eliva, you are the product manager for what is called the Red Jackets, which is your uh, um, your version of Advances Austria, I believe, right? Uh, something like that. Yes, definitely. Uh, hi, Rasmus. It's great to be here. And uh, actually, I want to continue on where Rianne ended with a community and uh, with this uh, sharing of experience and, and really building a network. Uh, it is true. I was uh, the Latvian national uh, partner and host for four years, and I'm very happy about <laughs> our and mine results because, yeah, uh, to host the Latvian national selection for four years and to come in second for uh, two times uh, was a, a great result in, in my opinion. But of course, uh, the, st the job is still not done because we didn't get first place. So I will definitely be back uh, at some point <laughs> in my career. Right. Uh, but in the meantime, actually, yes, uh, what uh, the Latvian Exporters Association, the Red Jackets does, and uh, it, it really builds this community and builds uh, on the story of the Latvian brands abroad. And here I have to say that it's not only the creative startups, but it's also uh, just our regular companies that are actually really uh, bridging the gap between the world and Latvia and, and telling their story abroad. And you might uh, ask why such a funny name, the Red Jackets. Well, 
it comes down to this uh, very historic image in it's a NATO summit in 2002 in Prague. And you might remember uh, that the Latvian former president, Vajravieti Freiberga, is the lady dressed in red in the middle. So with her permission, and, and she knows about this, so, so <laughs> all is well, we really took on the name uh, The Red Jackets because it symbolizes courage and bravery, but also uh, this inspiration to really stand out and you have to have uh, a lot of basis to go on that. So you can't really just uh, show and tell with, <laughs> when you have nothing to either show or tell. So you really have to uh, make sure that you own the stage, but that you have prepared to be there and that you have the, the knowledge and, and the ability to actually surprise the world with uh, what you're creating. And in, so in, November, is- in November 2002, that was only three years after the fall of the Berlin Wall. And uh, I suppose the the Latvian uh, startups and companies had to suddenly shift their attention from from the east to the west and to the south. So it was also a whole for you. It has been a, a new opening in many ways. No, Latvia. I think with uh, with the participation in EU and, and NATO, of course, has gone it the. The crossroads to all over the world have been open and especially with the digitalization and, and the internet and e-commerce. So so you really have so much to go on now. So that is why I also wrote that you're born global from day one. Of course, you might be based in, in Vienna, Copenhagen, Riga, Daugavpils, or it doesn't even matter where. Uh, you can uh, look at your local market and, and see it as a trial and, and a trial and error run. Uh, but to be honest, you're working for the world uh, from day one. And that is what we also tell our, our both startups and creatives and export companies, uh, that it doesn't uh, really uh, matter where you come from. But uh, we also created this Born in Latvia, I can show you later if we get there. <laughs> um, yeah, that we still can be proud of the place we come from because it symbolizes uh, quite a lot of things about us and, and tells a story to the world. And before, yeah, uh, the association started in 2013 and a lot of things have been done since that. So 120 companies and there are also creative and and small ones were awarded the title the Red Jackets and the Rising Stars. Uh, And so for the big ones, the the Red Jackets, you had to be exporting over 1 million euros to anywhere in the world. And we created an audit to find really the best companies. We went to brand audit and judicial audit and really see uh, who you are and what you do to the world. Uh, But for the rising stars, those were those creatives, those small startups that had to convince the jury that in the next five years, they can surpass the 1 million euro export amount. And there we have companies, yeah, like uh, Gigiblocks and and uh, these fantastic, and Sonarworks is actually the big one, uh, Solfeggio as well, to really uh, how we can prosper these creative startups uh, and put them together with the big existing companies, because that is so often uh, actually a recipe for success as well. Uh, so we have this uh, export to trampolines. It's, a, it's also like a mentoring program where you put one startup together with an existing big business and you see the magic happen because so often the big exporters want to help the small ones with guidance, with uh, contacts, with uh, just, you know, everyday uh, conversations. So you, they're a fantastic uh, thing to put together. Then we also went to Expo, created three fantastic books uh, that are still out there and uh, did... I have uh, one of them. I have the gray one. (laughs) So you have to have the other two as well. (laughs) Remind me next time. Uh, So yes, and this is here, Vajravid Freberg in the middle as well. And she got the books and and, uh, brought them to the world as well. Uh, Let's continue. And last year, so we understood in 2018, we had 100 companies for the Latvian Centennial. uh, And then we understood that it's kind of too early to retire. (laughs) And actually, we want to step it up a notch. And we created an an association uh, where you have to formally uh, join as a member. And currently, we already we started with eight last year, and now we have 30. And uh, the overall turnover of our uh, members is 818 million uh, throughout uh, the whole world. And uh, we really have fantastic uh, both uh, creative and regular uh, exporters. And um, 
Yes, yeah, so we represent their interests uh, together with the government. And I just finished a conversation with the Ministry of Economy. So to really, uh, together with the recovery fund and, and COVID and the pandemic, this is such a true moment to really be at, at the rails and help both creatives and exporting companies to really foster in, in the years to come as well. So, so, where, so where Rihanna is working within a, a public entity, this is a private association with yeah. public funding. Uh, no, actually, it's private funding, so we just have a membership fee, so everyone just uh, pitches in. Uh, but yeah, we're currently uh, trying to build uh, the association into something bigger uh, for, for the rest of the time as well, mm. and writing some uh, projects of uh, yeah European uh, level as well. Uh, so we also created a Latvian strategy for development, and that's been very, very interesting and a very democratic process because we're going together with the whole members and really pinpointing where we want Latvia to uh, develop into the next uh, seven years. And the ma main question is, what is uh, limiting you from growing with the percent, a thirty percent growth rate annually? Expo, uh, Rihanna, you also mentioned uh, some uh, of these kind of. Uh, exhibitions uh, and expo actually I think is is a great one uh, as well. Uh, we were in Astana in Kazakhstan last time and uh, we are very closely working with the Latvian pavilion in Dubai as well and uh, there may be fans of these kind of exhibitions and I know some definitely aren't uh, but to be honest uh, these kind of opportunities to tell your story and your countries uh, through the lens of of a national pavilion, they sometimes work and they sometimes make a fantastic fireworks uh, for you as the company and for the nation as well. Uh, so that's uh, what we're working together with as well. And here, yes, I mentioned the Born in Latvia and I'm gonna stop here as well to really, uh, in the allocated time, is this Born in Latvia sign. And you can see it here. Last year, we just printed out these uh, uh, yeah, stickers basically, and we told everyone uh, just come with your uh, either product or game or whatever it is, and, and let's see how it works on your product. And uh, to be uh, honest, uh, some of the companies actually use them, uh, especially, yeah, those that have a physical product, you can also use it online, of course. Uh, except for the national flag, how else do you symbolize that you are born wherever you are? So this is something that we have created and there's this big uh, country branding process that Latvia is actually going through at the moment. So we hope that it's going to be a part of that. So yeah, uh, born global since day one, uh, create the community, tell the good stories, whatever it is. Oh, I didn't mention there were the three books, but there's also treasuresoflatvia.com. It's a digital platform that we've built for nine months and it has Latvian fireworks export going to the whole world. So uh, that is something that uh, we live by uh, every day. And we really hope that uh, it is of, of value to us and, and the world as well. Thank you Excellent. so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Liva. And by the way, to all of you, if you have questions, uh, write them down in the chat and we'll take them as we uh, as we when we end uh, these uh, these uh, uh, four presentations so uh, so please uh, don't be shy uh, write down your questions and we'll call you out and ask them to share but thank you Lila. now um in Catal in, in in barcelona in catalonia we have the isek isek uh, and i have been working with uh, isek for uh, many years now uh, especially on uh, innovative financing schemes uh, new ways of funding uh, uh, the creative industries. And uh, I also have a, a great friendship with some of the, the past, the directors of, uh, of Maria Basora Fornell's uh, place. So uh, Maria, um, this is not just about uh, access to finance, apparently, that you said, but also internationalization. And you're in charge of that. What, uh, what kind of measures do you uh, do for the Catalan startups? Yeah, or the okay. cultural enterprises, as you call it. Yeah, we, call, we mostly work with enterprises. And as you can see in my background, uh, we are Catalan Arts. Catalan Arts is the brand uh, used for the international promotion of Catalan companies that operate in music, performing arts, books, visual arts, and digital culture sectors. So we touch this bunch of sectors. And to this end, the brand strengthens the presence of Catalan companies and creative works at international fairs and K professional events. It's, it's an interesting, sorry, Maria, it's an interesting choice of, of words because uh, often when we talk about arts, we talk yeah. about that's something that's public funded, you know, and then you said in the same sentence, K 
companies. You know, you said you talked about enterprises, uh, cultural enterprises. So it, uh, does this any for you? It's fine in uh, these concepts of something being uh, the arts, but still being commercial. Yeah. So in this case, these companies should have this uh, enterprise uh, mood. Thinking, I mean, yeah, they should think it as an enterprise and not as a public uh, entity. Yeah. So for public or for foundations or um, associations, for example, there is another department in the Catalan government that helps that helps to this. Uh, to this good. Group. I think it was just good to clarify that this is about Catalan okay. arts, but the commercial side of it. <laughs> yeah, of course. And we also offer. Uh, all kinds of useful materials and resources to professionals based in Catalonia uh, to develop their projects internationally, as well as to professionals from other countries looking for artistic products and willing to establish contact with their creators and promoters. So, for example, if you're if you're looking for Catalan cultural uh, products or services, you are the ones that could help with the connections. Yeah, we can connect with uh, all the companies we, we work for. And yeah, if you try to find services or um, funding, also funding or to make co-production, or also we can, we work on this um, focus, Catalan focus, we can uh, uh, choose uh, on a specific kind of companies and we can uh, present to different uh, countries or in different uh, fairs and we can exchange it. And we can bring these foreign uh, companies or, or festivals to our country because we also work pretty close from with different initiatives that uh, may, you maybe know could be Mira Festival or uh, this new one is Mutec or also uh, Sonar Plus D yeah. or Primavera Sound that also have these, these um, it's called Idea Showroom, and they they uh, select a sum of of these um, creative industry uh, industries uh, projects to make them um, show in this in this Primavera Sound. Mm -hmm. That is not also happen in Barcelona. That also will take place in United States, and they are working on other places to be. Yeah. We have we have a great collaboration with Sonar Plus D. It's a yeah. fantastic, uh, fantastic uh, event uh, that's uh, not just music, but also a lot of, of tech and, and creative industries and stuff. Uh, I wonder uh, how important is it for the cultural uh, enterprises of Catalonia to actually be from Catalonia when they go out in the world? Uh, I know that uh, Liva touched a bit on it. Uh, I, I remember reading an interview with Lars von Trier, one of the most well-known Danish uh, movie directors and and when people it was financial times and they asked him so what's nordic or what's danish about you and he was like nothing you know so he was he was not at all trying to claim to be danish in his in his, in his uh, expression of his art uh, do you have a, do you have do you have a feeling there, or is that an issue for for your startups that you work with is it good bad to actually come with a brand uh, in your on your a label on just like Liva showed it So I think it, uh, yeah, we have this, um, this brand that is well known for in many uh, regions and countries because we had a uh, presence in some international festivals. And for example, is now I'm now here as Catalan Arts, but, but we also have Catalan Films that promotes this audiovisual industry. And we try to, to promote uh, some, um, things that is uh, emergency, entrepreneur, and also um, the women power also, because uh, we thought that uh, we have a, a big power now in the audiovisual industry uh, as uh, directors or screenwriters uh, as women that um, we support a lot. And we also in the, this year, we will have a focus in Cannes, in Marché du Film de Cannes, uh, with this um, with this kind of brand that is new wave, Catalan new wave of women. 
Excellent, excellent. We we actually also here at CBN have on women entrepreneurship and how you guys um, uh, sorry to say uh, you men, but actually if you're an investor wanting to invest in a in a in a creative startup, go for those with female founders because most likely you will have the best return on investment. That's what all studies show. But also um, when we have uh, female creators, uh, the stories are different. The stories are are uh, more relevant. Uh, or what happens when you have that focus in your internationalization effort? Yeah, it is said that the that the stories that are uh, has been telling for these women directors are more sensitive or more familiar or more close to to our life, maybe. But besides this thing, um, I mean, I don't know. It might be this authority. Is this this a specific point of view of life that is uh, shown by these films? And yeah, I'm yeah. gonna. Ex excellent. So now we we have heard from uh, from Austria, from Latvia, and from Catalonia, and we we can also go back to all three of you. But first. Um, I, the reason why I asked Mark uh, from Pocket Sky to join us today was that uh, I met him in 2014 at the Global Finals here in Copenhagen. Uh, you did rather well. Uh, and then we bumped into each other at Slush. Uh, Slush is this event that happens uh, usually when it's dark and wet and gloomy in, uh, in, in Helsinki uh, in November or December. And you were there with Pocket Sky and um, I tried on a couple of Pocket Skies and uh, you maybe I think you can best tell about the the product uh, and uh, also tell about what are, have your how have you gone from selling um, Pocket Sky in in Austria to finding maybe some areas where the, the sun actually disappears for quite a while, yeah, uh, where the markets are more maybe more obvious than in Austria. Okay, so, so yeah, I start uh, so. Mark Weilerberger, um, co-founder from Active Variables. Um, we are a small health tech startup from Vienna. And um, our first product is the Pocket Sky Light Wearable. Um, it's by far the smallest and uh, most convenient uh, light wearable on the market. Um, and the principle behind uh, light therapy in the end is very simple. So um, all of us have a, a sleep-wake cycle and this sleep-wake cycle is determined both by um, our sleep hormone melatonin and by the sunlight, especially by the blue component of the sunlight because you need melatonin, um, therefore it's called the sleep hormone to fall asleep, but um, you don't need it um, during daytime because um, if you do not have enough sunlight during daytime, uh, your body is producing melatonin also during daytime and this makes you fatigue and you are, yeah, even, um, it, it can, even can come to depressions. You don't have you don't have any uh, with you there, or that you can quickly put I'm, on. Or... I'm really sorry. I'm very bad prepared. I don't have one here. Sorry. Okay, I'll, I'll okay. ask Daniela to to quickly Google Pocket Sky, but it's really <laughs> is pocket-sky.com, and sorry. it's a pair of, of designer objects. It's a, like a glasses that you that you wear without glass in, but that will send blue light into your eyes. Exactly. So if you're living in the Nordic countries and you suffer a bit from depression or that you, uh, you, you, you have a hard time when the sun comes up at nine and goes down at three. So that's not the case right now. We're going towards some of the longest <laughs> days right now. Uh, then it's actually a good idea to get a pocket sky. Exactly. But, uh, so uh, this, is, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so this blue light, you have special receptors on your retina and if they get this blue light, um, they start to suppressing your sleep hormone. Um, and so we talk about, we also wear it slush because of the most common use case. This is winter blues, definitely. I mean, it affects the Northern Europe countries. I mean, it starts maybe even in Austria, Germany for sure, uh, Scandinavia, definitely also the US and Canada. Um, and um, slush was more a startup uh, fair. So it, it was one of our first uh, affairs because I mean, it was this startup theme. We wasn't on the market then. Um, and what we, rea what we realized is um, um, that people in the north are very well aware of the, of the theme, let's say like this. Yeah? So Slush was almost our first fair, I can say. Then we was in, on a second startup fair in Berlin. It was TechCrunch. And so, so we got uh, quite some insights of the startup scene and, and, and this was the beginning. 
Um, and then we had a look on the CES, just because it's the by far the biggest consumer electronics fair in Las Vegas. Um, also quite interesting because you have really all the world there. So we checked there that uh, quite a lot of, of wholesale requests are started there and, and stuff like this. And, and we met the CEO of Sony for a short time and he liked the product. So this was also quite interesting. And then we decided to move a little bit more to, um, uh, to different use cases because, because of the wearable is that small and that mobile. Um, not only this use case, which is uh, which we have for decades called Winter Blues, where also quite a lot of products exist, mostly stationary products. But uh, because of this mobility, there are completely new use cases. Um, so the one use case uh, is, is shift work. It's really a severe danger to your health if you make shift work for years. Um, yeah, people... Uh, have, have to do a lot of with, the, with their health. So, and, uh, so if you start, and it's in the end, it's quite simple because um, you start shift work with a lot of melatonin in your body. Sure. I just yeah. want to see if, if, if uh, Daniela found a uh, pocket sky so we can actually show it. I know that Ankit, he proposed a use case that uh, people working in IT and being inside all, all the time. Uh, so there we have. Thank uh, you. And sorry for the pocket skies. Now you can all see what we're talking about. Uh, Winter Blues, you can scroll a bit further down, Daniela. Better sleep. Yeah, and I know quite a few people that use it that people. are yeah. extremely happy with it. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Daniela. So now you all have an idea of 198 uh, euros if you want uh, a pair of pocket skies. Thank you, Rasmus. Yeah, and so three use cases. So winter blues, um, uh, shift work, and also jet lag is a use case. So you can um, alleviate your jet lag by um, switching your, your body to the time zone for your destination. That helps a little bit too. Yeah, and by going abroad, um, by the beginning of the development, we tried to, de to develop a product which is a one-size-fits-all unisex product. So even before COVID, we was aware that our main, our main uh, business case should be online sales. Um, and this helps us quite a lot right now because, um, yeah, it works quite good, B2C, really, so for, for customers. Um, we started Austria. Is, Germany is a big market, definitely. I mean, for all Austrian countries, Germany is a very important market because it ten, it's 10 times bigger. But interesting, uh, also, also in Switzerland, more, a lot of Swiss people buy it. We have quite good access, uh, success in the States and in Canada. Yeah, and so... How, how, if you can reveal it, how much of your revenue comes from outside Austria? 95% about. How much? Above 90%. Above 90%. So, so that's, you are definitely an export company here. Definitely. We sell more to Switzerland than to Austria right now. It's interesting. So don't what, have, what, have, what have made you, uh, what have, how, how did you manage that? How did it happen? In the end, we try also, I mean, I, I come from the design side. Uh, my company, my, 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 my company is more the, uh, the sophisticated uh, science guy. But in design, you really have to, 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 um, to take care that everything is simple from the beginning, but not only the product, but really everything, the business case. And it's really simple. I mean, we have it here on stock and we sell it worldwide uh, from, from Vienna. And it's really not a big thing because if you send it with, with DHL, it's in two or three days in Japan, it's in two days in the US. Um, I, I can understand all that with distribution and logistics, but but People in Japan and in the U.S. need to know that Pocket Sky exists. Uh, That's to true. Order it. And we, how how did that happen? Did the, was it was it the, the fairs that you've been to? Was it word of mouth? Did you do some campaigns? Did the, we, did the Advantage Austria help you? We launched or, it. We, we, uh, so the, the product launch was 2019 um, via crowdfunding campaign. Um, this was quite important to us because uh, the commun the commun community was really worldwide. I mean, you, you, you don't earn a, a cent with crowdfunding anymore because, I mean, you have to do a lot of activities that people find you on Kickstarter and later on on Indiegogo. But it was important uh, to go to public. It's more a marketing... Uh, yeah, it's a promotional uh, activity. Exactly, exactly. 
And then one goes to the other because we have been on Kickstarter and then some guy wrote from a German television uh, series. Uh, it's called Höhle der Löwen. It's like Shark Tank. It's this, but in Germany. Um, so uh, one goes to the, in, into the other. And so, yeah, you start that people get to know you. Right now, I mean, it's quite seasonal, even if, even though I told you the two other use cases, um, shift work and jet lag, winter blues is by far uh, the best use case to promote. So it's kind of seasonal product right have, now. Have so, there been any barriers? Because I think this is classified not as a design product. It's not like buying a, a new vase or something. It's a, a med tech product, isn't it? Yeah. Have, have there been some countries that have said, oh, they, they, that they put extra uh, uh, tariffs on or something that there are barriers no, to entry of certain markets or has it just been smooth? Right from the beginning, because when we started Kickstarter, we was afraid, oh, does it go through, through customs in the US or something like this? We had no experience, but we are astonished that it's quite easy, not big, no big problems, even though in, even, even in Japan, we have no, uh, Japan is sometimes faster than the US, but I think in Japan is there is a new customs, uh, the, the EU has, has some, uh, everything works fine. We have problems uh, maybe uh, getting a product back from India. So um, if people don't, don't like the product and send it back, there are sometimes problems from, from certain countries. And we are not allowed to sell it in China. This is really complicated with customs. And, and with Russia, we had also some sometimes problems with customs. But in the end, it, it works quite OK. Yeah? And we give the we give the customer the benefit because the customer has to pay customs clearance, but the past the, but, but the customer outside of the European Union that do not have to pay any taxes, and so this mm -hmm. this this brings everything into balance and that works that works quite well. I can I can try and connect you with our partners in China and in Russia, uh, oh, so you go out, because are these not are there. not that small markets actually. Definitely. Uh, <laughs> so now we thank you very much, Mark. It's a fantastic. Uh, uh, the journey you've been on since uh, I met you in 2014 at the CBC Global Finals. And now there's an opportunity for questions from you guys. Uh, we have only about seven minutes left. Um, and I wonder if any of you have any questions for any of the speakers. Um, or are you just shy again? Rasmus, can I raise a question? Yes, go ahead. The first uh, three speakers. I'm uh, actually coming from uh, a country where we are, uh, you know, perhaps not in need of the um, very last product. But just uh, I'm coming from Athens, Greece. You're from Greece. Great. <laughs> and I was wondering whether, you know, um, Maria Basora and uh, Niva and, you know, the first speakers have any um, put forward any um, specific policies with respect to, uh, you know, one very specific portion of the uh, cultural industries I'm referring to art galleries. So, uh, so, so this is very specific on art galleries. Basora, you know, was wondering whether, for example, you have specific um, um, incentives and or, you know, facilitation mechanism, for example, for, um, for a Catalan gallery, pick up, uh, you know, one I know. In, in addition to your question, I, I, you could maybe add all three of you. Yeah. What makes the cultural and creative industries different? I mean, what, why is it different for all three of you to, uh, to promote the creative industries compared to clean tech or med tech or whatever? But let's, uh, let's see if any of you have some, uh, some specific measures for art galleries, especially Maria, maybe. Yeah, we also work with galleries in our international department. We have a specific uh, line i mean um like a public uh, uh help that you can apply for and we pay for expenses you have in in your internationalization plan mm -hmm. but this plan must be uh internationally not uh, in catalonia not in spain so outside and there's traveling costs uh, hotels also promoting costs, translations. And if you want to organize, for example, a pop-up and invite some uh, buyers, uh, it's a cost that you can you can be paid for in this line. And so we you cover, also- So you cover some of the direct costs for, um, yeah. for, for them going abroad. 
And we do the same with all sectors. We work for the audiovisual, performing arts, music, and we also have this, this focus. And now we are working in one that will uh, start in Barcelona this year. And uh, because we also have four offices, uh, uh, one in Paris, London, Berlin, and Brussels, and we want to have a focus uh, on the, uh, in each country, uh, picking uh, uh, a famous fair and bringing some Catalan galleries, especially young galleries, young talent, mm -hmm. to, to, yeah, to do this kind of road trip. And mm -hmm. uh, we will be in, in Vienna, last year, next year, hopefully, because this year the fair will take place in September, but it's not sure. And we also will be in, in, in Berlin. But so, as I said at it, the beginning- can I, so can I ask, maybe uh, don't take it as a provocation, but I just ask it for you, when you go abroad, is that the rest of Spain as well? No, we work just with Catalan companies, but if this Catalan gallery has a Spanish artists or international artists can be in this catalog and mm -hmm. can go. Uh, so but, but, but you're not helping any Catalan startups to or, or creatives to go to, to Madrid, for example, they have to go beyond Spain. So in your international um, project has to appear at least one or two international uh, activities. I see. So I see. If, if, if you have in mind that the typical cost for uh, actually participating in an international art fair. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, uh, Gerasimos, we only have three minutes left and I know Rianne wants to, uh, okay. to just add something. Thank you. Yes, um, I just wanted to add that we also have uh, various uh, offerings for art galleries. Uh, so we also uh, bring them to international fairs. But for example, we also use uh, certain um, platforms such as the European cultural capitals to plan events uh, around this. And as you said, you are based in Athens. I, um, we are also looking in the direction of Greece uh, because of Elefsina. Uh, Elefsina, I don't cultural know if capital. I pronounce it. The cultural Sorry. capital. Yes, exactly. And uh, we are still thinking about our concept there, uh, what we are going to do there. So if you have a gallery yourself or if you have any ideas how to collaborate, we would be very open for that, mm -hmm. for brainstorming and seeing if we can bundle our forces and do something together. Excellent, excellent. Well, I didn't get my, answer, my, my question answered about how the creative industries are different. Uh, because we only have about a minute and a half left. Uh, I don't know if you want to add, Liva, uh, you've been working on all sides, maybe a quick 15-second uh, answer on how are they different, the uh, creatives, when you export them. Yeah, they are different. Um, first of all, from the scope, uh, from the ability to reach anyone anywhere in the world, uh, in the sense that uh, if it's underlying culture or great design or music, it, it has no language barriers uh, in the sense. So uh, in that sense, everyone is your target audience and the world is your market. Um, of course, there are a lot of struggles uh, at the same time. The creatives, they often forget about the business side. They don't have a big enough team. They don't have big enough finances to start exporting since day one. So there's a lot of that goes hand in hand with uh, and that are maybe sometimes lagging behind. So every opportunity to share their story or exhibitions or CBC or anything to mm -hmm. tell the, your story to the world and search for new contacts and be a part of a greater ecosystem, uh, I think is the key to, to really stepping it up. And then at the end of the day, it comes back just to business, uh, to the business plan, to your contacts, to making it happen mm -hmm. and, and uh, really uh, telling the world uh, the story. So at the end of the day, yeah, maybe it does not uh, matter so much if, if you're selling socks or, or a music instrument or, or an art gallery, uh, but you have to make it work and pretty often with the same instruments at hand. Thanks, Liva. And uh, thank you to all of you for participating in this webinar, and especially to Rian, Maria, Liva and Mark uh, for sharing your experiences with internationalization. As I mentioned in the beginning, this is just an appetizer of 
our uh, one month course on creative industries policies. We call it SIPs. Yeah, uh, right now, uh, Daniela is, uh, is sharing something about the SIPs. Uh, and uh, I just want to say it's true that these creative products can travel the world. Uh, Daniela is crazy about La Macarena that most of us have danced. And she can actually give some extra instructions on that, but we don't have time for that today. But Daniela, the, the, the closing remarks are yours. Yeah, uh, thank you so much uh, for all the speakers that we have been with us and for all of you that have been participating. And if you are interested in these topics, uh, we invite you to join this, uh, this uh, course, this seminar. Uh, it's called Creative Industry uh, Policy Seminar. It's going to be around uh, 20 hours in June. And these are a few of, uh, of the main uh, topics that we're going to have. So uh, I'm going to put you in the chat, all the links and everything to do um, if you want more information. And of course, you're going to hear uh, more about me in an um, email. Thank you so much for joining and see you soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. <laughs>